Hi everyone, we hope you are all doing well. I'm Claire and I'm the editor-in-chief of The Choate News. And I'm Nikki and I'm the managing editor of The Choate News. As we all know, because of the coronavirus pandemic, Choate has switched to remote learning for the rest of the spring term. We at The Choate News wanted to help answer some of your questions about the school's current and future plans. So we're here with head of school, Dr. Curtis and Dean of Students, Mr. Velez to do just that. Hi, Dr. Curtis and Mr. Velez. Thank you for sitting down with us today. Claire and Nikki, great to see you. Thanks for having you. Fighting us. Of course. So Dr. Curtis, you're the head of school and obviously you've been dealing with a lot this past month or so to say the least, but still we wanted to start with a slightly less predictable question. <laughs> we know this term has taken a lot of, has required a lot of flexibility on the part of our teachers. And as it happens, you teach the course every spring. So how's your teaching been going? Oh my gosh. Um, I do. Um, well, first, I, get, I shout out to my awesome class. So, um, you know, clearly the best class in the school. We don't have to say that for them. Um, I, I feel incredibly fortunate to be teaching. It's where in, in, in the, particularly in this spring. I mean, I always feel it's an important thing if I can do it. And I have been able to every year at Cho to be able to teach because um, experience the Cho classroom is a really important thing for me in the larger picture. Um, it connects me with a group of students. It's why I got into this educational field was to be a teacher so to continue to have that chance to do it is incredibly meaningful but to do it obviously this term has been very important for me because I, I have experienced not quite as much as our faculty as a whole but but the challenges that and our students have, have have faced and and I've seen firsthand the way that my students have responded which I think is representative of the, of the larger student body and they've been remarkable I mean it's it's it's, it's, it's got its challenges obviously and we, we, we're spread out all over the globe so we work work with that and um, but we've got into some rhythms with with office hours and and the different the classes being at you know the times that they are and how we can work synchronously and asynchronously um, I, there's a little bit of a special challenge for my class that it's actually based on Cho architecture and its historical antecedents so a big part of the class is actually walking around campus and seeing campus and being there so that did require a significant redesign of how we're still doing those things but how we do it so we've become best friends with google earth and you know we walk around and and, and i go out and take photos of, of a specific thing that a student wants to see for the next class and we and we, and we look at those things so you know we're, we're working ways around it um and on one i'll just emphasize on one hand it's tough because it reminds us of what we're missing by not being here particularly the students it's you know obviously it's easy for me being on campus but for our students on the other hand, it's a great reminder of what we hold near and dear, which is the experiences that we've had on campus in those spaces and why there's a, and so the, the reflecting on that, which is a big part of the class of understanding how the architecture and the ways we work interact, we can still have that achievement. It's even more poignant and meaningful um, when we're away. So there's, there's been some real upside on that front, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's been a different experience. Um, and, and I'm just very grateful to the way that our students, have, my, my students, but all of our students have responded. Yeah, so kind of on that note, it's, it's clear to see what's different in our classrooms right now, but is there anything that kind of surprised you by staying the same? Oh, surprised by staying the same. I mean, the things that have stayed the same, I'm grateful for, you know, having extraordinarily inquisitive, thoughtful students who despite the separation, despite looking at these, you know, the screens on there, still doing those, those, those things. So in some ways, I suppose I'm surprised that how much of it has carried over. I actually thought that it was going to be harder to build up a, 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 a you know, especially a class that starts, you know, a class that had run through the whole year. You know, you establish a culture in your class. There's a, there's a, there's a camaraderie that exists. Um, I, I think I was surprised that we've been able to do that as well as we have for a class that started off from the beginning. Um, and I, I guess I should have had more faith in Cho students, you know, ability to adapt and their their growth mindset and their and their thoughtfulness and their inquisitiveness. They want to they they want to learn. And we talk, especially for a group of seniors, um, the, the about this being about learning and and um, you know, especially with a PDF scale. I mean, they could be mailing it in, right? And they didn't hear me say that they shouldn't be. Um, and no one should be. But they're not, not because, you know, I'm, I'm saying that to them every day, but because they genuinely, I think, are excited to learn. And that's, what, that's why you come to Cho. That's why you come to our campus to, to get that part. And I, I've seen that continue within the classroom. And I suppose I shouldn't be su surprised, but I'm excited by that. And for Mr. Velez, you've been a teacher for almost 15 years. Is this sort of 
the toughest situation you've had to deal with as an educator? Uh, so, so I guess I'll start by aging myself even more. This is actually year 16 um, in, in, in the, as a, as a faculty member. And, and if I want to age myself even more, it's, it's year 21 of being affiliated with Chode if you go back to my days as a student. So um, it definitely, so, you know, if we rewind back to July and we had the Hill House fire, um, I was pretty certain at that time uh, and, and as the year progressed that that was going to be the toughest situation that I was going to uh, have to navigate in, in my first year as Dean of Students and uh, it looks like I, I might have been wrong at the time and um, so again in, in reflecting on on my career what I would say is um, I've had many challenging moments as, as an educator at Choate um, you know, thinking back, loss of, of colleagues and, and mentors, um, the passing of former students and, and athletes, um, and, and those have all been tough situations to, to navigate. And um, in some ways, those were um, isolated to a, a kind of smaller set of individuals who were impacted. And, and I think our, the current situation, um, the fact that there's you know, kind of great uncertainty surrounding COVID-19, um, that is, is what's made it really tough um, and, and probably, you know, could, could very much so be argued as the, the toughest situation that I've faced as a faculty member at Choate. This is for, I guess, either one of you. Um, so, so much of the Choate experience is being on campus together. Um, so how can that element of attending Choate in any way be replicated through distance learning? Yeah, so I'm happy to, to take this one. Um, so we're certainly doing our best to replicate um, the various elements of, I think the, the key here is, is kind of creating that um, a level of togetherness and kind of the opportunities for um, students, faculty, staff to be, uh, you know, in, in an interactive forum. Um, and obviously that's happening in a, a remote environment, but um, the best we, way that we can do that is, um, again, to provide as many opportunities for uh, people within the community to connect. And um, again, I, I think, you know, the, the offerings that, that we put out there um, have been pretty um, wide, you know, kind of, I, I guess there's a range, um, the, the breadth and depth of what we are offering, um, I think. Is, is something that um, not not every other school out there is is really doing this and, and I think you know the goal from the outset was um, we knew that we wanted to maintain the, the rigorous academic program and Dr. Curtis spoke to that um, about you know the, the caliber of students that we have at Choate but also um, you know I, I will say that I was at the start of the term and continue to be inspired by my colleagues on, on the faculty the teaching faculty who have taken a lot of time and, and were taking time out of their spring break to reconfigure syllabi and to think about how various activities would work in a remote learning environment so you know that's that's one way um, that that we can view this you know this togetherness that I spoke of um, but at the same time we're also looking to complement the the academic program with opportunities outside of the classroom and so um, you know offerings in uh, the realm of student activities um, the uh, the clubs and, and their interactions on campus um, even in this environment and how active they've been with various initiatives Initiatives. Um, student council, um, Ula and her group have done a phenomenal job of um, taking this in stride and, and really serving as uh, a positive resource for the entire student body. Um, and, and again, I, I think one of the one of the strengths in all of this is the level of collaboration that we're seeing. I think it, it would be things would look much different if we just had kind of all of these groups groups that I mentioned um, working independently. And I think the success that we're seeing or, or what we're seeing as being most successful is when we have um, a series of groups or departments on campus who are willing to work together towards a common goal of um, recreating that on-campus experience and, and that feel. So um, if you look at, you know, for example, what the wellness art and athletics uh, departments are doing right now um, with initiatives such as the Saturday series and, and other um, opportunities for not only students, but also, again, ad adults in the community. Um, 
that I think is is really unique and special and it, it celebrates the spirit of collaboration and, and kind of the innovative nature that Choate has always um, tried to champion and at least the Choate that I've known has always tried to champion and so um, again we're, we're trying our best as I said before to mimic what we would typically see on campus um, and, and the, the aim there is to, to build a stronger community um, and so again, you know, we're we're about to hit May. May is a really special time for for six formers, um, and so you know we are looking at things like you know how do we recreate senior dance lessons? How do we uh, have special senior events like bingo, karaoke, and and other um, you know kind of memorable moments that would typically mark uh, that final month of of this of a six formers time at show. And looking beyond Choate, we see that the economy is in free fall. Nearly 30 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits. So what is Choate doing or considering doing to help support students' families economically? Yeah. I mean, it's obviously a very difficult time. One of the things that we asked patients from our families was, was to understand our finances for this term. And last week, we were able to give an answer to that. So I think the first step that we did was to look at what people had paid already, um, because you know there's, there's two payments people make for their, their tuition uh, bill, uh, that we were not spending money on, that they, they had a reasonable expectation uh, of being provided. So the big areas were food, people not being on campus and not eating that food, uh, transportation without, so obviously athletics and other travel that, that, that we do, um, and, and, and a, a few other pieces. And we, 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 we put all those together, calculated it was 1.58, Five five eight million, I think it was, and we felt there was an obligation for the reasons you you, you gave, but also just morally that we should return those dollars to our families. So we announced that last week of um, you know based on tuition paying and prorated for financial aid families that we'd return all of that all of that amount. So families are letting us know right now um, whether they want that back. They have an option to donate it back to the school as well. But um, but we hope that was understanding of the situation and not saying you know we're just going to hold on to that money to use for the, for the school moving moving forward and obviously the biggest obligation people have um moving forward will be tuitions for next year and, and we're obviously working very carefully um to support our families in that with financial aid and increasing that mm -hmm. and are fin financial aid and stipends and things like that still available to students right now yeah, so we um, we made a decision that the stipends that our financial aid students, many of our financial aid students receive when they're on campus, uh, we budgeted for people had had based um, sort of their educational, uh, their time and education around. We felt like that that was another obligation we do. So those, I think the checks went out. We're working. Some people are in different places and we're wiring money, but we're we're making sure that. Uh, the financial aid we put in place for this year, absolutely, is no question, and then those stipends, which are, um, have actually been sent out, and then obviously there's 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 financial aid and those stipends for next year would be in the, the same commitment. Mm -hmm. And so throughout this process, is Choke concerned at all about its own finances? That was a simple. That was a question, a very complicated question asked very simply. Well put, because um, it's actually complicated. If I can, I might break it down into two different ways because um, it's hard to answer that with, with, with as uh, simply. Uh, so one would be long-term. Um, and I think the answer to that is we feel very good about that. The school has been received tremendous support from our alumni for a long time. We have, we have a strong endowment, um, an excellent endowment. We're very grateful. We've got a long record of, of successful fundraising and an annual fund that's supportive. Um, students want to come to the, the school. We have a strong admission. We feel we have a great reputation and, and an extraordinary program to offer. So I think long term, all those things remain in place um, and we feel we feel fine. And in fact, some of those those elements suggest, you know, we'll be fine to get through even the short term. But I think in the short term, we face like everybody else. I think, how, how did you put it? That it's, you know, there's economic free fall. I think you, you said, you know, that, that it's impacted everybody. And so the schools is reliant on a number of revenue streams without going into too much detail but the big one obviously is is tuitions and i think it would be reasonable to expect the revenue that we raise from that to be less only because we expect to be giving more financial aid out and that that, that obviously comes for that's the opposite of revenue would be would be the aid you give out and that's and that's the right thing to do and we're, that's not a problem but it does mean we would expect to, to see less money raised through that uh the other the other thing the big thing is the draw on the endowment the, the, there was a big obviously drop in in the markets they've recovered some but that will have an impact 
with the campus closed, we're not renting out facilities. There's some revenue from that. Uh, we're very hopeful that we can have a great summer program this year, but it's obviously new because it's online. So whether that will raise as many dollars is another question. And then we have an annual fund each year. And again, our alumni and parents have been incredibly supportive and we're hopeful that that will reach um, you know, high levels as ever. But if you look at each of those, they all have some level of threat because of, of, of where the economy is and where people's lives are. I mean, we, we understand that. So I think in the short run, we're being super careful to conserve as much as we can. We've, 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 we've um, put a freeze on hiring so that we're, we're looking at everything. Can we handle what we've got rather than adding? And if we do need to add that person, we obviously will. We've looked at discretion to those things. So we've done some things that enable us to be careful, but not impact the student experience so that you know, we're, we're aware of the issue, we're aware, we, we, we're planning and being careful. We obviously made long-term plans that mean that the school have um, has significant number of options, but we also know we need to offer, you know, we, we want school to be back, we want to enroll students just because that's what Cho does, but also because of the, the financial aspect. Um, we hope that we'll still continue to receive the extraordinary support we've, we, we do through fundraising. Um, and, and, and by being extremely careful, we, we, you know, we can get through this. So it's not going to be without challenge. And I don't want to downplay the, uh, you know, I think your question, you know, was, is, are we worried? Or, you know, this is, you know, yes, it's what I, I spend time worrying about, but, but it, there are solutions. And I don't think it should worry students because um, I think we can take care of those issues and they should feel, you know, I, I asked the question honestly to you because the news deserves that answer. But I, but I think if, it, if a student was asking me just from that point of view, should we be worried about finance? I'd say, I'd say no, because... Um, you know, we're working hard to address the questions that, that a bad economy bring up. Mm -hmm. So with campus closed, as of right now, students are not allowed in their rooms. So they need to ask administrators or teachers to help them go into their rooms and retrieve whatever important items they need. We've heard from a lot of students who say that while they understand the necessity of this dynamic, it also makes them a little bit nervous. And here's a question that's been on a lot of students' minds is, if an administrator or faculty member found an illicit substance in a student's room, would the student receive punishment for that? Yeah, this, this sounds like it's up my alley. So, it's um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of things, and, and thank you for, for clarifying a couple of the points, and I'll just reiterate those. So um, as you pointed out, um, you know, we're not entering, no, no adult is entering student rooms without permission. So, you know, we're not doing anything in terms of, you know, along the lines of room searches or anything like that. Um, typically, if a student has reached out to an adult on campus, um, it is because there is an essential item that they need. Um, and, and we have coordinated ways to, to get those belongings to those students. Um, all that said, um, you know, existing school rules are still in effect. So, um, you know, if I were to walk into, if I, if I was working with a student to retrieve an item that was deemed essential, um, and I walked into a room and just happened to see something sitting on, on a desk that was in violation of our rules, um, I would have concerns. And so, again, I, I think it's important for students to know that, but it's also important, you know, with rules in place, it also means that policies such as safe haven and other measures are also in play currently. And um, if students do have concerns, um, they should certainly be reaching out to, to any adult. Again, you know, safe haven, one of the, um, I guess one of the, the beauties of it is that um, students can contact any adult on campus who they feel comfortable discussing a matter, a matter with. And so, um, again, I would, I would just reiterate that, that um, if students do have concerns, they should definitely reach out and have those conversations. Um, that said, again, you know, we're not entering rooms without permission. We're not, you know, kind of rummaging through personal belongings. Um, when adults have gone into rooms, it's been kind of with very specific instructions that what I need is, you know, located in the top desk drawer. And, uh, you know, adults have been, um, I think, uh, very good about following those directions and, um, and respectful of privacy. Again, we, we view these rooms and, and these spaces as um, an area where students do deserve to have that privacy. So again, I, you know, I know that, um, you know, we'll get to a point where we, we start to consider and we already have started to consider possible plans for um, what 
what packing of rooms looks like and, and clean out. Um, and so we'll, we'll likely revisit this policy in terms of, um, you know, some of the concerns that you raise in the question. Um, but again, I would, I would, you know, just reiterate again that whatever we come up with in terms of policy or plan, um, existing policies will be in, in place. So um, again, I mentioned safe haven as one of those. Um, so again, these, these are all, um, you know, topics that are being discussed, you know, within the Dean's team and, and at the administrative level. Um, so Mr. Velez, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but in the spring, our campus hosts a number of year end events that will not be able to proceed as scheduled. So how do you guys foresee things like commencement or prize day happening this year? So maybe I'll, I'll cover commencement just because we met with the seniors. Um, we have, as you know, we have four meetings today. So um, I did meet with the, with the seniors and did uh, talk to them a little bit about commencement. So maybe I can repeat that for, for, for you. Um, we have a stay home, stay safe order from the governor of Connecticut that's in place till May 20th. There's no indication that'll, that, won't, that it won't run all the way through to May 20th. So we're going to assume that's the case. And we also, every indication is even when that's lifted, that there will not be gatherings of large numbers of people. So I was, I was up front with the seniors that I can't see any way that we can do graduation on campus on May the 31st. Um, not only would it be too short a time to arrange it, we don't think people can travel here, nor do we think we'll be allowed to hold such an event. And that's, that's the reality forced upon us. It's difficult, it's difficult to accept. It's, you know, that's obviously a, a highlight event, an important event. So we're gonna do something for the seniors on May 31st, virtually. We'll work out a way. Um, they'll certainly have their diplomas um, or, or, or the choke graduation conferred upon them so that they'll be able to go do the next thing. Uh, they don't miss out on that. Um, but we do wanna, but also made a commitment to them that when it is safe and possible, um, Bible will come back to campus and do something. And we've actually sent out a survey to them to ask them what, um, what are the important things. So if we can only come back for a couple of days, whatever it be, can we prioritize what things we can do? I'm not making that decision, but we really want the feedback from the, the seniors of what's most important to them beyond the actual commencement ceremony itself. Um, to do. So um, we'll work out, you know, we're keeping all those options open. Uh, wh when it looks like we can come back, we will. Um, it's important to do and, um, you know, uh, uh, we'll, uh, and we'll see their feedback the best ways to do it. And other events, you know, we'll look at other things to do if we can do them virtually. Um, we will. And so, you know, the other, other closing, you know, you've seen, we've been working how to do school meetings and form meetings. I think things like prize day and end of year events, senior speeches, right, Mr. Velez, I think those fit into, um, we just got to work out what the way to do them. But I think, I think there'll be some version of most, most events that we think can, can be done in appropriate ways um, using, using the, the, the tools that we're now getting used to. Great. Looking into the next academic year, how do you see all of this concluding? Where do you think we're gonna be next fall? Um, I wish I had an answer to that. I think I'd make a fortune, right, if I knew what the answer to that <laughs> was. Um, I don't say that to duck the question. Um, it, four months is just such a long time. Um, we, the, it, this feels like it's been going for a long time, um, but you know, from, its, from the virus's first, well, we're trying to work out when it first came around, but, but, it, but it wasn't much more than four, four or five months ago. So August, is, August, early September is a long way away and a, a lot can happen. I think a lot of things that would help us decide where we're gonna be um, will, will happen in that time. So there's a few things that can be really clear. Uh, Choke will be opening and educating our students in a fantastic way in late August, early September. Our goal is to do that on campus. That remains, that was, that's always been our stated goal. That, that remains our goal. And if there is a way to do it, we will. So that's our priority right now and what we're planning on. But I would, um, I also want to be honest that um, I don't know enough today to guarantee that and say it's absolutely going to happen. I think, I think we'll be where, you know, we will not be an exception. If schools are able to be open, Choke will be among those schools on campus, will be among those schools open on campus. But if um, that's not possible in, in, in Connecticut, across the world, or the, or, or all those things, um, then we'll, you know, we'll adapt to that. Um, the other thing I would add is we're going to be open and offering education and we're doing, offering it to all of our students. So in all the scenarios that we work through, we are aware that it may be a challenge for, we may be able to open on campus and do some things on campus, but it may be hard for all of our students to come here. We will work out a way for them to um, get at least certainly an edu the educational experience to be part of an academic, keep that academic progress going and involve them as much as possible. So, they should know they are high in our thinking, 
and that we will work out ways to support all of our students um, as best we possibly can. And we're, we're, we're actively setting up different scenarios. So, so what my job is, is um, we don't quite know for sure, which, which I said to the, we had a staff and faculty meeting. Um, the challenge here is there's a race, every year is a race, right? It's a school year, if you think of the school year as a race, we normally know where the race starts, most of the terrain, although not all of it, and we know when it ends, and we can kind of pace, and we know we pace ourselves around it. We have a nice break, you know, for a long weekend, and we have another, and those things are pretty predictable because every year we run on the same race course. The challenge I've got right now is I'm not actually 100 percent sure what the course looks like next next year. I have a pretty good idea when it starts and finishes, though. You know where, you know what is it home field? Is it away? You know all those things, and so we'll know at some point what that is, and and we'll have to swing into action to put that. So what we can do now while we're waiting is, is try and work out what those possible solutions would be from the most likely to unlikely but possible and ask all the questions. What do we need to know? When do we need to make the decisions? What, what resources would we need? How would we do it? So that we can, we can plan any of them that we can answer now, we will. And then as we get closer, uh, and, and as soon as we're able to make a decision and be clear, we'll make that decision and swing those actions into place. So Joel will be open, we'll be educating, you'll be awesome, your class will be awesome seniors, you'll be leading us, um, all those things that happen, we just got to work out the exact details. Mm -hmm. And so we know that the decision hasn't quite been made yet, but is the school currently making any preparations to enact health or safety precautions just in case we do return? Because there seems to be this inevitable spike in cases that will happen regardless of whether or not it's deemed safe to go back. So like, for example, some schools have proposed contact tracing, regular testing. Is that something that Cho is thinking about? Absolutely. Um, yeah, all those are on the, on the table trying to work out how we would do that here. I think I would add sort of density. You think about our campus, we work wonderfully well on everything happening at the same time, right? You know, everyone's at lunch, we start the school day, we end classes at the same time. Um, and, and, and that works fantastically under a normal building community, being together. So we might have to put some of those things on the table. How do we make the place less dense, people coming less into contact with each other, so staggering classes. You, we're, we're very fortunate, we've got a large campus. So that's an advantage in terms of separating people. We've got lots of flexible buildings and space. So um, you know, one of the things would be classrooms, you know, using some spaces that aren't currently classrooms, but it would allow us to have more space or having less students in classes. I mean, I think in one of the things you mentioned. So all of those are being considered and made possible parts of our plan. I think one of the advantages that we've got, and, and I think some of the examples you're getting are from these examples, is that there are countries that are opening up right now. That, um, you know, I know China, I know South Korea, I think Germany are starting to either have or beginning to send students back. And so they're putting those procedures in place and we get, we get a chance to see how they work and then how we would translate that into a, a, you know, American boarding school environment. So that's a longer answer, a simple question, which really was just, yes, we, we, we're considering all those, those pieces. You're, you're quite right. They're very important. Okay, so this is kind of a big question, I guess, but the spring term usually gives you guys more than one opportunity to send off the senior class. So what do you have to say to the class of 2020? Um, so I guess I'll start. I would say that um, as a faculty member, but also as a Chode alum, and I've got my vest on today. Um, so my alumni vest, I look forward to welcoming the class of 2020 to the Alumni Association. Uh, but I just want to say thank you for all the contributions that your class has made during the four years at Chote. Um, you've made our community a more vibrant one. And um, I will just say that um, lasting impressions matter. So let's have a, a strong finish to the school year. I, you know, I'm biased. I have very strong personal connections to the class. So it's, it's, you know, every class is very meaningful, but obviously I, I have a, a personal connection, um, in my family. Um, so I would say this to any class, um, you know, how much I miss them on campus. Um, and, the, you know, we're going to do everything we can to support them and make it as meaningful and special as we always do. It's just, we've got to do it in different ways. Um, the only, you know, I, I always look for the silver linings for what, for what they're worth. We'll, we'll, it'll, it'll be different, it'll be unique. Um, and we're gonna have some great stories to tell at the 5th, 10th, 15th, 20th reunion. Um, they'll be in the history books. I think one of our alums said, said those things, that um, 
you know, they'll, they'll, you know, in some ways we'll be, you know, we're taking more care of them. Um, we always take care of our students, but, you know, we're going, we're going to go all out to do everything we can because we know um, this has not been the senior spring they're expected. I'm so sorry. I'm, you know, we're so sorry about that. And the class has been great. They recognize it's obviously not a choke decision. It's a larger piece, but it still doesn't mean we can't um, empathize with them and support them. And that's, you know, just, I just would want them to know how much we're there for them and how much we want to do for them. And then the on the opposite side, what would you like to say to the class of 2024, our incoming third formers? Yay! <laughs> um, thank you. I mean, it, it, thank you, thank you, thank you, because this is a class that um, did not have spring visits. It was one of the very first things we canceled. I'm very grateful to the admission office, an incredible job. Um, the communications office, an amazing job. Um, and this is, this is um, a group of students who some of whom have been to campus earlier on, but many of whom hadn't. I mean, for many people, it's like, I'm going to wait till the school I get into, or, you know, the opportunity to come to campus is limited, or they want to know which schools they're into to visit them, all good reasons. And suddenly that was, that was pulled away from them. And so they spent the time to get to know our school and understand it and, and work individually often with, with mission officers. So we, we thank them for that, for that leap of faith and for, for doing that and, and, and recognize the challenges that went with it. But wow, we can't wait to see them um they're you know they're going to bring extraordinary energy and talents uh, to campus and um it's it's going to be exciting to have them so they are totally part of the community and um i'm i can't wait to meet them and welcome them in all the ways that we no we normally do so so it's a, it's a it's a great group of new students and welcome to show i guess it's the big thing yeah, I would echo a lot of that message. Uh, we're excited to welcome them to Choate. As Dr. Curtis said, I've heard nothing but um, rave reviews from Mr. Beaton and, and his admission team who did a fantastic job uh, during this year's cycle. And um, the message of uh, stay healthy, stay safe. We look forward to welcoming you to the Choate family at the start of the academic year and go Choate. And that goes to everyone, go Choate. I mean, I just, I'm just so grateful to all of our students. I'll just end by saying, I, you know, I managed to get to four, four meetings today and just flicking through the pages and seeing all of our students. That's what matters to me. It's just all of you. And I'm, I can't wait to see you all again. I thank you for everything you do for the school and uh, take care of each other. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Curtis and Mr. Velez for sitting down to talk with us. And thank you all for watching. We welcome you to share your thoughts with us. You can email us at the Choate News at Choate.edu or follow us at Choate News on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And we hope you all stay safe and healthy and we hope to see you on campus again soon. Mm -hmm.